Metallurgy plays a crucial part regarding swords and how well they perform, so let's go through some of the basics. When you want to use metal to make a sword, you of course need to get it out of the raw ore, which we mine from the earth. To make it usable, it needs to be melted down or made malleable enough to clump together that you can then shape into the sword. As that metal starts to cool down from being heated up, it solidifies in pockets of crystals that grow outwards from a central point. As these crystals grow outwards and touch the border lines of the other crystals, it forms what is called a grain. And it's this crystalline grain structure that metals have that affect their strength in a large way, on top of just how strong the raw element is to begin with. Bronze is considered a softer metal, but after they were formed into weapons, swords, they could be work hardened in their cold state, compressing those grain structures, actually making them a bit stronger. That doesn't mean work hardening any metal makes it universally stronger, but for bronze, it did work out, and and they would work hard on the edge, making the edges stronger as a result. You also get similar benefits when work hardening iron, because iron is also a softer type of metal. In fact, a work hardened iron sword has similar strength properties to a work hardened bronze sword. The thing is though, as soon as you heat up the metal to a certain point, where those atoms actually adopt a different phase with how they're sitting with one another, the grain structure that comes into the metal from cooling down gets completely removed. And when the metal cools down again, new grain structures appear as the crystals form once again. So even if you're forging a blade, compressing it down, hammering it, making those grain structures much smaller, as soon as you heat it up again, you can reset it. This is a process called recrystallization, or in forging, normalization. And oftentimes, metalsmiths, swordsmiths, We'll reheat the blade and let it cool down in several cycles because it normalizes the grain structure, resetting it completely. So then, why did we switch from bronze to iron if they're actually comparable in their overall toughness and strength? It's to do with the prevalence of those resources. Iron is vastly more plentiful in Earth's crust than either copper or tin, but the problem with iron, it takes a much higher temperature to become malleable to either stick together or melt. So people more often used bronze in tools and weapons, not because it was more prevalent, they lacked the technology to work with iron. But once the technology became developed, iron being far more plentiful was a much better resource to make tools and weapons out of. There's also an added benefit when it comes to iron. As soon as you start smelting iron, because you often use a carbon-based fuel source, you invariably start to make byproducts of steel, which is much stronger. Steel being an alloy of iron with carbon diffused in it basically gives the iron atoms less room to move around. Kind of like if you had a room full of people and then you filled it up with bowling balls as well, filling up all those gaps, making it even harder for people to move around. It's kind of how it works with adding carbon to iron. In fact, people were accidentally making steel as early as 3000 BC, and they recognized it as being superior because some of the earliest steel artifacts we find are in jewellery, not tools or weapons. And humans usually devote the precious rare material to make jewellery out of, hence why they were making steel jewellery. But they also realised it was much stronger, and so making tools and weapons was a very clear and direct result. Going on to the microscopic level of how the carbon plays into the iron, is important to understand the different types of steels that you can make in the modern day. The percentage of carbon plays a very important role, but the three types of crystalline structures that first appears when you're adding carbon to iron is ferrite, which is just basically raw iron, cementite, which is the combination of iron and carbon but with a very high percentage of carbon content, and it manifests in the ferrite as thin lines. And then you have a mixture of cementite and ferrite in these lines, which is a structure that is called perlite. Perlite is cementite and ferrite together. And then depending on the percentage of perlite, which is a reflection of the overall carbon content, will also reflect if the overall steel is either high carbon or low carbon. Low carbon is mostly ferrite with pockets of perlite structures, High carbon is low ferrite with mostly perlite structures to having all perlite structure. It's a very interesting give and take. The ferrite doesn't just have room for all this carbon being put in. In fact, it creates stresses and the ferrite is trying to push out the carbon from its spaces. Basically, the rest of the ferrite forcing carbon into these 
localized higher density pockets, which is still a mixture between iron and carbon, just forced into a higher percentage where we see these lines of cementite and then lines of clean ferrite. The thing is though, it needs a bit of time to force the carbon into these more dense pockets of cementite lines, resulting in the overall perlite structure in different percentages. And remember, this is happening as those crystals are forming as the metal cools, creating this crystalline grain structure. If you can speed up this cooling process, you can rob the ferrite of enough time to force out the carbon into these more dense pockets of cementite structures. Because the thing is, when the metal is heated up to a certain phase and it doesn't have these crystal structures, the carbon is actually diffused more evenly because the atoms seem to have a bit more malleability and it's easier for the carbon to be diffused. It's only when the crystals start to form does it want to force out the carbon in its locations and we get these structures forming. So if you can speed up that cooling down process to give less time for the carbon to be forced into the cementite structure, you can actually trap the carbon into a more uniform dispersion in the ferrite and it results in a new crystal grain structure called martensite. Martensite, as you see, has a much more chaotic, less uniform and smaller grain structure where all these grains are intersecting each other, which actually creates a much stronger structure than your regular perlite one. In fact, it can be so strong it can become brittle if you cool it down too much. The amazing thing is if you actually release some of that stress by reheating up the metal to a small amount, making the metal have a type of orange tinge, we're not red hot glowing white or yellow, but usually just an orange heat on the blade will release those stresses in the martensite structure and that creates a spring. There is such an intriguing, complex interplay between these steel structures, not just in how it can work in a regular blade, but also you can make a blade to have different carbon contents by utilizing different grades of steel and then cooling it down at different rates, having it adopt different grain structures as well, which is what we see in the Katana as well as many European blades like the ones coming out of Toledo. There are pros and cons to those methods, as well as adding other elements to iron on top of just carbon, adding a little bit of silicon can also increase that flexibility. And that's where we come to much more sophisticated and complex modern types of steels. But that is a subject for another video. This was just a quick crash course on the importance of metallurgy in swords. This was a dedicated video filmed exclusively to the Shadlands YouTube channel. If you'd like to see more informative and entertaining sword-related content that cuts to the chase and is straight to the point, please subscribe so you don't miss out on the exclusive content, as well as the super cuts and clips from the longer-form Shadowversity sword-related content. If you'd like to see the longer-form deep-dive sword-related content, be sure to check out Shadowversity. Thanks for watching.